But up until the 20th century, military engagements were generally conducted pursuant to congressional authorizations, short of a formal declaration, a practice the Supreme Court upheld in 1800. That was the norm until President Truman sent American troops into Korea. Since that time, as Anthony was saying, we've seen an increasing pattern of presidents introducing armed forces into conflict overseas without congressional authorization. Recent examples include multiple military deployments by President Bill Clinton, including actions in Bosnia, Haiti, Kosovo, Sudan, and Afghanistan. President George W. Bush's intervention in Haiti, President Obama's airstrikes in Libya and Yemen, and President Trump's airstrikes in Syria. To a shocking degree, the justification for this pattern has rested on pure bootstrapping. In OLC opinion after OLC opinion, the executive branch has argued that it can do it because it does it, and because Congress has acquiesced. As a result, what was initially understood as a narrow Article III power to repel sudden attacks has been recharacterized as a sweeping authority to engage in hostilities and to initiate them in order to defend, quote, important national interests. A theoretical constraint on this authority is the War Powers Resolution of 1973, or WPR. Under this law, the president must report to Congress within, within 48 hours of introducing troops into hostilities or situations where hostilities might be imminent. Uh, within 60 days or 90 days, if the president extends it, of the deadline for reporting, the president has to terminate the use of armed forces unless Congress has authorized it. Congress can also, at any time, require the president to withdraw armed forces uh, by passing a concurrent resolution, otherwise known as a legislative veto, which takes effect without the president's signature. <coughs> Excuse me. The WPR hasn't worked for several reasons. First, instead of reading the 60 to 90 day limitation as a backstop to enforce constitutional limitations, presidents have read it as an acknowledgement that the president has a free pass to make war for 60 to 90 days without congressional approval. <laughs> second, second, presidents have routinely evaded the reporting requirement by interpreting the term hostilities uh, to exclude pretty much all of the techniques and practices of modern warfare. Once again, Congress has almost completely acquiesced, making no effort to either authorize or prohibit military activities undertaken without the requisite requirement. Finally, in 1983, the Supreme Court held that legislative vetoes were unconstitutional. Uh, that was in a different law, and it's not 100% clear that the same result would obtain for the WPR, but it is at least quite likely that in order to end armed conflict today, Congress would have to muster a veto proof supermajority to do so. <clears throat> now, I've been talking about the, pro the problem of presidential war making without congressional authorization. Another pattern that we've seen in modern history is presidents exceeding the scope of the authorization that they're given when Congress does provide authorization. A living example is the 2001 authorization, authorization for the use of military force. The 2001 AUMF authorized the use of force against those nations, organizations, or persons who the president determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons. 18 years later, this law has been invoked 37 different countries, including against organizations that did not exist on 9-11. Three successive administrations have pulled off this feat by interpreting the AUMF to apply not only to the specified enemies, but to any, quote, associated forces, a term that the executive branch has stretched beyond any common sense meaning. The obvious solution for, for that kind of overreach is for Congress to repeal the authorization, perhaps pass a law clarifying the authorization, refuse to fund activities beyond the scope of the authorization, <coughs> Instead, a bill introduced by Senators Corker and Kane in 2018 would have given congressional busing to presidential war making by adopting 
the executive branch's definition of associated forces and authorizing the president to determine who qualifies. In other words, Congress would be authorizing the president to go to war against enemies of his choosing. That would be delegating away the most central aspect of Congress's war-making authority, which is the designation of the enemy. Why does any of this matter? Recall that the purpose of giving Congress the power to declare wars was to keep us out of wars. We are now been at war for 18 years, the longest period in our country's history. There are soldiers being deployed to fight today in a war that started before they were born. This war has costed over $5 trillion. More than 6,000 American soldiers have lost their lives, nearly 50,000 wounded. By conservative estimates, 30,000 civilians have died in Afghanistan. This is exactly what the founders sought to prevent. Now, there are signs that Congress is interested in taking back some power that it's given away in the uh, areas of war powers and related areas of foreign relations and national security. In April, Congress voted to end U.S. military activities in Yemen. That's both houses of Congress by majority. In July, Congress passed three resolutions to block arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. In March and again in September, Congress voted to terminate the national emergency Congress declared in order to divert funding to build the border wall. Thus far, these efforts have failed because Congress hasn't been able to muster a veto-proof supermajority. And the lesson is that once Congress gives away its power, it is exceedingly difficult to take it back. So I will leave you with that observation slash warning and turn it over to the other speakers. Sure. And I'll also briefly mention, after we provide uh, brief overviews of the papers we've written for the event, we'll also have plenty of time for questions and answers. We will turn the streaming off for that period, so maybe perhaps that will be people feel a little more comfortable and a little less filtered, so feel, feel, feel free to ask any questions you might have. And so with that, I think it's fitting that I go first. My paper um, that, I, that I wrote for this event, Why Congress Can't Sue to End Military Conflicts, largely talks about what uh, Congress can't do. I think it's appropriate maybe that I provide that warning before other members talk about what Congress should or can do. So mine begins with a discussion of the infamous case for Matsu versus the United States. Um, I say infamous because history has not been kind to the Korematsu decision, which ruled that Fred Korematsu, um, his detention in the cap camp for Japanese Americans was a military necessity. Even at the time, Justice Jackson's dissent recognized that once a judicial opinion, quote, rationalizes such an order, the principle then lies about like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that could bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. And even in the decades after, commentators and scholars have criticized the Korematsu decision. And even last year, in Trump versus Hawaii, the travel ban case, you saw a line here at the end of Chief Justice Roberts' majority opinion um, in response to a line from the dissent saying, quote, Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided, has been overruled in the court of history, and to be clear, has no place in law under the Constitution. Justice Hugo Black wrote the majority opinion of Korematsu. And although Korematsu is no longer good law, some of the concerns, even from back then, still resonate in federal courts today. Consider one of the lines in Justice Black's majority opinion. He rationalizes that courts cannot judge the government's actions, that military action, from the calm perspective of hindsight. Um, I think this position is somewhat supported by reporting later that in conference after the oral argument in Korematsu, um, Justice Black said reportedly, someone has to run this war, either us or Roosevelt, and we can't, so Roosevelt has to. In short, Justice Black was concerned that military orders and other aspects of foreign affairs is simply not the stuff that federal courts should be involved in. And even today, those raise important concerns. One, what is the judiciary's role in war? Two, are the federal courts truly unable to adjudicate foreign affairs disputes from, quote, the calm perspective of hindsight that was used in the court of Monsa decision? As been mentioned already, flash forward to recent events. In the 17 years since the 2001 AUMF, Congress has not approved any additional uses of force. However, as been already noted, the United States continues to engage in hostilities around the world. So when it comes to war powers and military orders, if Congress doesn't like what the president is doing, what can they do? And I think today's going to be a great example of them uh, explaining all the actions that Congress could perhaps do and the tensions involved in that. One of the things, however, they are going to struggle with is a remedy in federal courts. This is where some of Justice Black's worries still hold true. 
Challenging the President's overreach in foreign relations has largely failed. The President has shown us this throughout the decades. Um, through a variety of common law barriers, the two that I discuss most in my paper are standing and political question. So what's standing? Standing comes from Article 3 of the Constitution. It talks about judicial power is limited to cases and controversies. This means a case has to be justiciable. It means that in, to bring a claim in federal court, you have to have been injured. So how do you prove that you were injured in the foreign affairs context? It's difficult. It's difficult to show standing. Um, if you're a citizen, being a taxpayer or passionate about an issue is not going to be good enough. For members of Congress, it traditionally has been even more difficult. Time and again through the decades, you see individual members of Congress trying to bring suit against the executive branch for frustration and disagreements about military orders, arguing it's unconstitutional, arguing it's going against the will of Congress. And then time and again, we've seen these cases be thrown out of federal court. Um, often, these courts look at the issues and offer, look at the unique position of Congress and see it as an institution. I've noticed um, one DC circuit, I think, sums it up pretty well. Mentioning, mentioning that Congress has institutional remedies to handle what these individual members of Congress are trying to do. Um, passing laws, appropriation powers, even ways to hold a president in contempt for violating the law and the will of Congress. But even if a member of Congress, or Congress as an institution, can show standing, there are other common law barriers that come in the way. Another one is the political question doctrine. Um, this doctrine comes as early as Marbury v. Madison where Chief Justice Marshall wrote that mere political acts may, may not be examinable in the court of justice. Today, that has turned into a balancing act. Courts look at a variety of factors. Um, for instance, looking at the case of Baker v. Carr, which is probably the leading case still on this issue. Courts should look at the history of its management by the political branches, which is a, which is a check against Congress. You should look to the susceptibility of judicial handling in the light of its nature and posture in a specific case another check against Congress, and the possible consequences of judicial action, another check against Congress. With this lens, it's easy to see why foreign affairs suits have, against the executive branch often fail. Because Congress has little chance of successfully suing the block executive military action in Congress, even citing institutional concerns, often affairs no better, we should take light of what the courts have told us. Congress should start looking towards the institutional power. These doctrines emulate Justice Black's concerns as far back as World War II and before. Judges are unable to run wars, and when it comes to foreign affairs, courts are more than happy to defer to the political branches. So my argument being that Congress would look into how to check the executive branch and engage and raise its voice in foreign affairs, it's going to be far more successful on the floor than in the courtroom. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks to everyone who come to this very much needed discussion, and uh, hopefully we'll figure the answer out and we'll solve all the problems. As a preface to what uh, to what I'm about to say, and kind of contradict myself just now, is that there is no one right answer, at least in my opinion. Um, when we think of the Congress and the President and foreign policy and military policy, we think of a rule book somewhere that we all can, can go to and we can look up the right answer, and then boom, we've got it. And if we just if just yell at the top of our lungs enough, then it's going to work out. And while we have the Constitution, the, the, the nature of that relationship between the Congress and the President under the Constitution it determines the way that rule book is implemented. And it is a more of an ad, uh, adverbial process. It's one that's determined via action. But let's look at foreign policy in general. And military policy is a subtext of that. Franklin Roosevelt once said, it is the duty of the president to propose, and it is the privilege of the Congress to dispose. This is a modern notion. It's been especially prevalent in foreign policy and security policy. But let's look at it from a different light, from a different perspective. A presidential scholar, political scientist, Edward Corwin, shortly after Roosevelt spoke, a couple of years later, wrote a book in which he says, the actual practice under the Constitution has shown that while the President is usually in a position to propose, the Senate and Congress are often in a technical position, at least, to dispose. This means, I think put differently, that Congress has the power to dispose, not the President. In other words, Congress is more powerful than the President when it comes to making foreign policy, at least formally. 
Presidents since Roosevelt have acknowledged this fact, albeit indirectly, by intervening directly in congressional deliberations on a regular basis to influence what Congress does. The President himself acknowledges that Congress is more powerful than the presidency when it comes to foreign policy. So in the context of foreign policy, this gives rise to what Corwin, uh, Corwin calls an invitation to struggle for the privilege of directing American foreign policy. It's baked into the Constitution's separation of powers. In Corwin's words, the power to determine the substantive content of American foreign policy is a divided power. Specifically, the Constitution empowers both Congress and the President to participate in the process by which we make foreign policy, albeit in different and unequal ways. This leads to institutionalized competition between the two branches, and like all competition, who's winning at any given point in time changes over time. And so it's a dynamic relationship. Think of it as a pendulum that swings back and forth between the two branches. And where it stops and which branch dominates foreign policy making depends on how effectively Congress or the President wields their powers amidst domestic and international environments that are constantly changing. So today, there is no question that the president is the dominant force in American foreign policy. Think of Syria. It, it, it seems, at least according to the press, we read that Trump woke up one morning and decided to withdraw troops from Syria. He's provoked bipartisan um, uproar on Capitol Hill. Yet, there doesn't seem to be any effort, um, at least beyond talking about it, to reverse that. And that may be a good thing. It may be a bad thing. But the Congress is, is acquiescing to what the president is doing. But the Congress has lots of powers to reassert itself, so it can it reassert itself again now. Uh, we typically think of Congress reasserting itself as, as being somewhat against what we call endless war, and I think in many respects that is what would happen in the long term. Uh, Congress at least is closer to the people, and so presumably the people don't want to be engaged in endless war, considering it's their sons and daughters who are being sent overseas to fight and sometimes die in these wars. But in this interesting case, you have a situation where Congress seems to be much more hawkish than the president. So let's look at it and kind of turn it on its head a bit and say, well, why doesn't Congress use the powers that it has? What powers under the Constitution does it have? Well, the Article 1, Section 1 gives Congress the power to legislate. Only Congress, incidentally. It's an interesting thing to keep in mind with the, the docket case across the street at the Supreme Court today. You have the, split, uh, the spending clause. The origin, um, which gives Madison says, the most complete and effectual weapon with which any constitution can arm the immediate representatives of the people for obtaining a redress of every grievance and for carrying it into effect. Uh, the Constitution, Article 1, Section 7, Clause 1, gives the House of Representatives the power to originate um, appropriations. Yet now we talk about automatic CRs. We have much, much of the federal budget is, is mandatory spending which the House gives up its power. Madison acknowledges that this makes the House really powerful. By not acting, the House can simply refuse to provide money to the President. The Commerce of Foreign Nations Clause gives the, the Congress the power to regulate trade, right? The, um, we have Congress can declare war. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 12 empowers Congress to raise and support armies. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 14 uh, empowers Congress to make military regulations. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 empowers Congress to call forth the militia to repel invasions. The Senate has the Treaty Clause. Uh, the Treaty Clause gives the Senate the responsibility to ratify treaties that have been made by the President. The Appointments Clause gives the, uh, the Senate at least the power to, <coughs> to agree to or it makes them responsible for agreeing to confirming people who will be in the executive branch who will help the president formulate and implement foreign policy. And Congress can use these powers to shape and restrict, if necessary, the, uh, the president and what the president does in the realm of foreign policy. But, all, but in all of these areas, we see Congress choosing not to use them. Right? Congress doesn't legisl legislate much these days. We have the idea that you have to pass funding bills, and if you don't pass funding bills, then it's the end of the world. To the point where we have automatic CRs, which you then would get the, um, put on autopilot uh, domestic non-military or non-army, I should say, funding, which incidentally makes it hard to reverse the status quo. You have, in the case of DACA, which is a kind of foreign policy-related situation, um, the, the, the yeah, former administration funded DACA through mandatory uh, use of these associated with the border. 
so that Congress couldn't even stop what the president was doing in many members' minds illegally uh, by not passing a law to fund it. In all of these instances, the, the, the Senate chooses to just act as a rubber stamp on, on the president because the president deserves his or her team. But when you have this perspective in Congress, you're not going to be able to reassert yourself vis-a-vis -vis the president when it comes to foreign policy. Um, the president has a little bit of power in this area, I should say, but all of the powers that are enumerated in the Constitution that the president has all affirm the power that the Constitution gives the Congress to faithfully execute the laws. And so how does the president dominate foreign policy? Well, he does so and has done so since Roosevelt by either bargaining with members of Congress and intervening directly in those deliberations to influence what they ultimately do, or by going public and reaching over the heads of Congress and intervening in, with their constituents and pressuring their constituents to pressure members to vote in a certain way. And you have these trends since Roosevelt, where you have congressional reservation leads to presidential dominance, and congressional exertion of its powers leads to presidential reservation. We saw this most recently in the late 1960s and the early 1970s in response to Vietnam. So notwithstanding the president's recent dominance, the pendulum of power can swing back towards Congress at any point. The president is dependent on Congress to approve, or at least to acquiesce in, his or her foreign policy preferences and to provide the necessary funding. Thus, the power to make law and the power of the purse give Congress significant leverage over how the president can act. And this, I think, also points to a broader issue with Congress, a broader problem with Congress, and how Congress has ceded much of its power, much of its responsibility under the Constitution to the executive. And it, I think, relates to how we think about politics today. Most of us see politics, and I say us, I, I, I think most of us do not, by virtue of the fact that you're here, but I'd like to be as broad speaking as possible. Um, most of us think about politics as something that is not really fun to do, and you can't control the outcome, you can't predict how it's going to be, you know, it's going to end, and you have to give your opponents an equal right to or an equal chance to participate and influence what happens in it. Well, that's not a good thing when you think, if you, in the case of terrorism or war or global warming, that the planet's going extinct, that the, planet, that the republic may be wiped off the face of the earth by a nuclear armed adversary or terrorists hiding behind rocks. It doesn't matter. You're less prone to trust the process. You're less willing to engage in the process because you think the stakes are too high. And this is in all areas. It's especially prevalent in foreign policy today, but it is that way in all areas. So I think the first step to reasserting uh, Congress's power in foreign policy, it seems to me, is to create an intellectual climate whereby we trust the process to yield outcomes, whether or not those outcomes are what we want them to be. That is the important thing. And if you go to Congress and Congress flexes its muscles and the president vetoes a law and Congress overrides the veto, or maybe it doesn't override the veto, or maybe the next time around it will override the veto, because that breaks front page news. And then the people get more involved in every subsequent iteration of the policy process. That conflict that is generated brings more people into the process and more people can see what's happening. This is what happened with Vietnam. More people were reading the newspaper, more people were seeing what was happening as, as members of Congress were trying to challenge, as, as activists out in the, in the country were trying to challenge what was happening. And they made their feelings known. And, and you can't influence the presidency. The president is not, responsive, is not responsive to mass political opinion in the same way that Congress is. So when people get involved in the process, they're only going to go to one place, and that's here on Capitol Hill. And so if you want to end endless wars, if you think that people are with you, then you have a responsibility, it seems to me, to go to the one branch in our system of government that is absolutely fabulous, where you are meant to say, and that's the Congress. And it's pretty simple in my book. And until that happens, nothing's going to change. On that high note, <laughs> no, it's absolutely correct. And, and, and at least it's um, Oh. Well, no, I saw the rub. <laughs> They're going to protest. This is going to take action. Uh, all of what you've heard so far is a, is a pretty accepted notion that one, Congress has the, the rights, the enumerated powers, the, the norms, the ability to do this, but maybe not necessarily the political will to do so. So once we reach that threshold, the, the conversation shifts. But even more uh, fundamentally, I was tasked with the, the responsibility to, to take a step back 
and to, and to, to assume that Congress does want this, this power, to rein in some of those, those uh, enumerated powers and make use of them, but do they have the capacity to do so? So one, do they want to? And two, do they actually have the resources available to do that? Um, we, we use a fancy term all the time about congressional capacity, a, a good way of saying, does Congress have the resources to fulfill its duty? One of their main duties is in this, in this venue uh, of foreign affairs. And surprise to probably no one in this room, Congress is supremely overmatched, especially when it comes to issues of national security and foreign affairs and war, war making authority. So even if they wanted to, if they use the resources available at hand, they're facing a huge uphill battle right now. If they enter into uh, that invitation to struggle that we talked about earlier, that invitation for competition, they're going to lose, and they're going to lose bad. And so it's important to, to recognize this as a starting place, that if we want to them to regain this authority, to reuse these enumerated powers, let's give them the resources to actually have a fair fight. If they show up for this fight with the executive branch, they're showing up to this invitation to struggle with a slingshot to the president's tanks. And, and that's not good for anybody, and he's going to get, we're going to get rolled over in the process. So I looked at the committee uh, responsible for overseeing uh, Congress's role in these powers and even overseeing the executive branch agencies. So there's four on each side of, the, of each chamber. House and Senate Armed Services, House Foreign Affairs, Senate Foreign Relations, House Homeland Security, Senate Homeland Security, House Permanent Intelligence, Senate, Senate Intelligence Committees. Eight committees, four on each chamber, is responsible for conducting Congress's roles for all intents and purposes at the substantive level, at the committee level. And the resources they have are completely outmatched. They're completely overwhelmed. So to get at measures of discapacity, to measure Congress's ability to do its job on this factor, I use a, a few crude measures to just get at this fact-finding uh, part of the mission. The committee funding, funding allocated to these eight committees has been stagnant since 2001 when we factor in cost of living. It's stagnant. So since 2001, when the last AUMF was authorized, the committee level to actually oversee operations is completely flat, signaling that it's not any more important now than it was in 2001. With those committee funds, the staff levels of these committees are completely flat too. They're staffed with 97, the max I think was 97 of those committees, which sounds like a lot until we get to the comparative section. So please hold on to your hats, it's not good. Um, and when you break down those, even those staffers, you, you eliminate the communications, you admin, in, eliminate the administrative level positions, you're reducing yourself to, to just dozens of substantive staffers responsible for overseeing the departments, informing their members to take uh, the reins back on these decisions with unpredictable, uh, unexpected, unintended consequences at all time. You can see why Congress has purposefully uh, deferred the power to this, uh, of these operations to the executive branch. And then even with those few committee staffers tasked with this unfortunate, impossible task, the experience of those staffers uh, isn't trending in the right direction. We, we, we know that committees are the, the, the bastions of, uh, of expertise, though, where we want people to go. They often bring at the staff level, the, the most experience from agency perspectives or their career, uh, military perspectives, to give a sense of, uh, of expertise to the committee members and the committee itself. But even on these members, the longest tenure within any of these eight is less than six years. Less than six years. The shortest tenure of these eight committees is 3.4 years. That's not a long time. For something as complicated as this, as ever-changing as this, it's not good enough. And when you think about the last time an AUMF was authorized, we're several iterations of staffers. That, that 3.5 years turnover, we're several iterations away from the last time someone said, is anyone there to actually have experience to, that has done this before? And we're getting more and more to the point where that is not true even to an individual level on committee. The, when we start comparing these small numbers, these small capacity numbers and e internal expertise numbers to the executive branch, it gets gross. It gets very, very dangerous. So let's just take one. There's about 150 substantive staffers on the House and Senate Homeland Security Committees. Again, sounds like a pretty good number, and it is relative to other committees within the Congress. But there are 240,000 Homeland Security employees. 240,000. Which means if you, I speak in sports metaphors, so sorry if you don't, but <laughs> if, you, if you have a team, two teams of football, they have to, to oversee two stadiums worth, huge stadiums worth of actions in the stands. 
You can't do it. And with the Homeland Security, it has an, unbelievable, an infinite number of internal departments and programs and internal funding mechanisms where you have almost as many individual staffers as programs within those committees. Which means you have about a one-to-one -one ratio of overseeing that committee, making policy recommendations to change uh, those programs, which means you're not doing either of those things. You're just drowning in information and oversight requests and the, uh, getting them to, to comply with uh, what we notice and we readily admit is their legislative authority on these issues. It's an unfair fight. And just a last measure of, of optimism for you, the trend is getting much, much worse. So all of these things uh, are even worse than they were even just a few decades ago. So in 1995, then we're taking the four House committees and the two main departments, uh, federal agencies responsible for these things, the Homeland Security and Department of State. So you take the committees that have some jurisdictional oversight prerogatives over these agencies. In 1995, the spending levels, the authority of those spending levels between those two, uh, the executive branch was 1,000 times that of Congress. 1,000 times. In 2018, that had jumped to 4,300 times the executive branch is getting funding that is dwarfing that of the Congress. So while these rights, while these enumerated powers exist on paper, they have the authority if they make some conflict, conflictual decisions to actually take them back, but do we have the resources to actually follow them through? Do we have the resources to predict and provide expertise and play a more uh, level playing field of, of actors between the Congress and the President? Right now, we don't. So we should have that conversation before we beg members to take it back, because if they do, they're not prepared to actually own it. So it's part of the conversation, and I argue an important one, so I, th I hope it's part of that conversation both within, here internally and as we discuss things going forward to, to take some of those rightful powers back with the resources available to, to make them actually worthwhile. Thank you. Great, thank you. And for a moment here, we'll turn off the stream but be, um, so we can open up for Q&A. But before we do that, I guess um, Casey was mentioning the argument for increasing congressional capacity. James was talking about the strategies for Congress to reassert its voice. Uh, I guess my question for the table while we're turning uh, the stream <coughs> off, is there an advantage to doing one first over the other or trying to do it at the same time? Well, I think you, I think the details matter because in my experience, most of the staffers on those committees are going to reaffirm the president's role because they participate in the mindset right now that the Congress shouldn't be challenging the president. And so maybe you need more a bit uh, wilder, crazier members on the outliers of the left and the right to come together and just to say, well, you know what, I'm going to act regardless of what the, the consequences are because this is where I act in the Congress. This is what my constituents want me to